welcome to the Comic Stands podcast. If you'd be so kind, would you mind introducing yourself? Peter Cooper, cartoonist, rock on tour. Now, Mr. Cooper, why cartoonist as opposed to something like graphic novelist or comic book artist slash writer or any other designation for what you do? Um, because there's, it covers a broad range of things. So if I say I'm a cartoonist, aside from the fact that it's a good party conversation starter, a uh, graphic novelist is like, what exactly is that? Do you do, you know, uh, naked women in uh, graphic situations? Um, but cartoonist is sort of a broad term that, that um, at one point I tended to not mention that I did comics when I, as an illustrator to clients because they immediately wanted me to do um, like coloring like Superman or something like that. Uh, but now that's sort of fallen away and um, there's a, a, little, a more appreciation and understanding of it. But I, I just, I love the, uh, I love the designation because it, uh, it covers gag cartoons and the graphic novel and the short stories and um, I like a little bit of everything I do. And Illustrator just sounds uh, formal and doesn't cover the writing part of it. So it's a catch-all. Now, is part of the appeal of cartoonist also your influences growing up? Did you grow up on a lot of cartoonists? I did very much so. Uh, in fact, um, I had the good fortune to be a super comic fan at a pretty young age. So I started going to comic conventions when I was 11, which was in 1970. And so I got to meet a lot of cartoonists and see that work. It also was around my parents had a Charles Adams New Yorker cartoon book and Shel Silverstein. And um, uh, I saw the um, Phantom Toll Booth uh, with Jules Pfeiffer's uh, cartooning in it. Uh, and of course, I, the children's books I grew up on, like Dr. Seuss, uh, were you know, instrumental in my general interest. And uh, but going to comic conventions and reading comics at a super level of, you know, where I every week was kind of dedicated to the day comics came out and, and then um, just, you know, running to the store for that. And then my whole year was planned around going to New York from Cleveland, where I grew up, uh, to go to the New York comic convention. And I got to meet uh, people like Sergio Argonis, who does the marginals in, for Mad Magazine. And a lot of these people, Will Eisner, Harvey Kurtzman, um, the huge influences. And then um, my friend Seth Tabachman and I did a fanzine, in fact, starting when we were 11. Uh, and uh, the, so we were actually interviewing cartoonists. Uh, and, and so this was like, ended up being very much in my DNA. And it was really a wide net that I threw. I, I loved superheroes uh, when I was, you know, starting when I was about seven. But I also was reading Mad Magazine a little later, and uh, that's maybe the first place I saw uh, politics and humor collide. And um, and then when I started smoking pot, I I started getting interested in underground comics, and uh, uh, even before then, because I started seeing them before I was even of age to buy them. And uh, I just was really drawn to work like Robert Crumb. But so I ended up with with kind of a broad base. Uh, interest, understanding, and, um, and knowledge of, of uh, everything from illustration uh, to, to gag cartoons to comic books, uh, both you know, alternative and superhero. Now, you mentioned Mad Magazine, Sergio Argonis, and Harvey Kurtzman. Uh, Mad Magazine has come up a, a few times on this podcast. Uh, people frequently cited as an influence and you yourself um, you yourself have done some work for mad magazine. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, besides what you just mentioned about the, um, uh, the way they blended politics and satire uh, what, what specifically drew you to, to Matt uh, first as a reader and later as a collaborator? Well, I mean, probably one of the first things ironically is spy versus spy because you, you, know, you kind of read it before you've, even noticed because there's no words. And so I just puzzling out what uh, Antonio Prochias was doing with that and the super really graphic way he did it um, was, was really um, um, grabbed my attention and probably got me on a road where I was really interested in wordless comics. Um, Sergio Argonis was the same thing because he did a lot of, I mean, his marginals were wordless and then he did these books 
the shadow nose and a number of th things that were um, that didn't have any words. And I, I love the paperbacks of those that I would like flip through in my local drugstore that happened to carry mad books like in a corner. Uh, but, um, you know, the humor and the idea that adults were making fun of these serious institutions and doing it with, with uh, cartooning and that they were, you know, taking songs and doing parodies of them just wigged me out because it was, um, and especially with the extra opportunity to see the artists in person and see that they love what they were doing. Um, I mean, Sergio Argonis would come to a New York comic convention, there'd be a chalk, chalkboard there, and he would draw for an hour the whole scene of the, um, of the convention. And, you know, he did that uh, just because he was interested in doing it and having fun with it. And that, that didn't, you know, so the, that there, here was people who had grown up and they had jobs that were clearly play. And, um, but also making fun of the political figures of the time, like Richard Nixon. This was my, my like earliest sense of like, wow, you can do that. And um, I like political editorial cartooning as well. So there were lots of uh, cartoonists like Herblock and uh, Doonesbury was there and, and uh, in the, in the paper and, um, you know, just the, the, the daily uh, editorial cartoons. And so all of that was colliding um, as, as part of my um, general education in this form. Now, besides cartoonists and comic book artists, your work seems to draw a lot from graffiti art and street art. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Uh, can you tell me the appeal of that and uh, how um, how you decided to to implement that style into your comic book work? Well, I, I moved to New York in 1977. And at the time when I first arrived, there was a garbage strike, uh, two week garbage strike. So there were rats everywhere. Place smelled to high heaven. It was summer. Uh, there was uh, Son of Sam was running around uh, shooting people. This is an old. old can see movies about this. Uh, and um, then there was a blackout um, about a month after I arrived and uh, it was like a riot in the streets. And um, I just was like, I'm in heaven. This is fantastic. How exciting. It felt like the movie Shaft or Taxi Driver. And I, I had, a, uh, had visited New York year after year for comic conventions. So I was familiar with New York. And so it had this exciting appeal to me, but it was also, um, the grittiness of it was, was scary and it gave me a great respect um, for, for going into it. Like I knew that this wasn't like, you know, playtime to be in New York. You had to look over your shoulder and be careful which block you walked on. But there was also a lot of art on the street. There was just this evidence of people just doing it. Like Keith Haring was drawing in the subways. And so you, you know, and that was just like, free art for the public. And so, you know, there was this black paper that was put up over advertisements before they prepared for the next ad. Keith Haring looked at that and said, hey, I think I'll do some chalk drawings on there. And then, then we saw that kind of move out into the fine arts world, which was re remarkable. And he was doing murals around town. There was also a lot of the, the protest to what was going on. And, and now I was, I moved to New York when I was 18. I was getting more politically aware and, and more politically frightened with uh, Ronald Reagan heading towards office, the idea that um, you know we we literally might have a third world war, um, that we, we we were there was a, the Cold War with Russia and that was getting ramped up with um, you know warmongers like like uh, Ronald Reagan uh, coming around. So there were a lot of people doing re reacting with protest imagery that was sprayed on a wall. Uh, there were these shadows sprayed on the wall that were painted on the wall that represented the shadow that is left behind after a nuclear blast where the, the person is vaporized, but where their shadow was, it, it casts on the wall and um, things like that, which were, um, you know, the, you'd see these around and people were putting up posters, but then first rain, they would disappear. And, and it was very inspiring to see that. And many things that stuck around were done with stencils and spray paint. Um, and um, if you'd like, I, I can um, go into, I could show some imagery from this guy. This is a good time to share screen and, um, 
and, and do a little walkthrough of my PowerPoint. Absolutely. Go ahead. Shall do. So let me give you the full view on this. By way of introduction. So one of the things that was really important to me and just to talk about some influences was in fact the nuclear bomb. When I was eight, I saw this movie called Failsafe, which was about how the United States accidentally bombs Russia, uh, nuclear bombs Moscow. And in order to uh, avoid a, a third world war, we agree, explain that it was an accident and it will allow Russia to bomb one American city. And that was New York City is the choice they made, which upset me to no end since I wanted to move to New York. And also this gave me the opportunity to see that there was a bomb that I was unaware of up until that point that could blow up the world. And um, that uh, this went off in my brain. And it basically, I found it to be a very positive force over the years because it I was constantly trying to get things done before the bomb dropped. So I wanted to get my first book done before they dropped the bomb. Um, another important influence was insects. I, uh, at about age four, the cicadas, um, uh, or what people think of as locusts, came out by the, the, the millions or billions. And I saw this and I got became a real insect fan before I was even a comic fan. And I collected insects for many years. Um, this has gotten into my recent work. And it's one of the things I sort of recommend to people I teach. And one of the things I'm always saying is that a hybrid of your interests and passions is a really good way to find something new. So for me, the collision between my interest in insects and my, and my uh, cartooning gives me like material that I can really run with. And so this is a piece I'm showing from the New Yorker that I did recently on cicadas and one from the New York times book review also on cicadas, because we just had the, uh, Brood 10 arrived on the East Coast by the billions. Um, I do a weekly strip now for Charlie Hebdo, and I, am, I do their environmental column. And this is a wordless strip, and I, um, it, I get to explore my, my old uh, wordless influence, going back to what I saw with uh, um, Antonio Prohi as a spy versus spy. And so I get to comment on climate change and things like that through comics. Um, this is another piece I did um, for a magazine, also cicadas, a lot of cicada work because of Brood 10. Um, I recently, uh, last year, uh, ago, starting a year ago, September, uh, got a fellowship at the New York Public Library to, and the fellowship was, I'm going to study insects and do a graphic novel about the history of, of insects. So that's where that passion thing comes together uh, with, with my, uh, you know, it's probably how I managed to get a fellowship where the other people were like Pulitzer Prize winners and, and um, you know, New Yorker writers and things like that above my pay grade. But by having this kind of oddball thing of graphic novel, cartooning, and then my interest in entomology. Um, so I'm having an exhibition there coming up next month. And this is just my, uh, I put these images on the wall in order to, uh, demonstrate what my ideas would be for the exhibition. And we're going to realize this in uh, the next uh, few weeks. Um, another really important uh, influence on me is travel. Uh, when I was 10, my father uh, had a sabbatical and we flew to Europe and they bought a VW van, su super perfect for 1969, driving around in a camper van, uh, the five of us in my family. And um, we made our way to uh, uh, a boat and then went to Israel and we spent a year in Israel. And um, this is where I got to be an outsider. I probably would have been a fairly mediocre, um, you know, maybe interested in sports. I don't know, uh, a number of things that would have, that moving to uh, a place where I didn't speak the language, didn't understand the culture um, was knocked me off my, uh, my um, platform and, made me see that the world is round and understand more about um, different cultures. Uh, I just, it, it put traveling in my blood. And uh, in fact, uh, some years later I was traveling and I bumped into a woman who in 1984, who became my wife still is. And um, uh, we went traveling together. Um, we, we missed that part where you, they say, you know, you really get to know somebody when you're traveling. 
we started by traveling together. So, and, and sharing a room. So um, we got over the part where you wonder if you get along traveling. And later uh, um, in 1989, we went uh, to Africa and Southeast Asia for eight months. And uh, out of that came uh, a, a collection of my sketches and writings and comics. Um, I went to New Guinea in, in one trip. Um, and just through the years, I keep traveling. And one of the things that's so important about this for me is it allows me to draw without thinking about commerce. Um, I've, I, of course, have to get the commerce together to go traveling, but you can travel on the cheap and camp and um, a lot of places are incredibly inexpensive. And so, you know, you can have a room for $4 a night and a meal for 50 cents and uh, that you can go a long ways on. Um, and so I just experiment with style and don't worry about whether somebody's buying it or not. But that has really worked very well for me because I ended up bringing these things home and then eventually using them as projects. Um, I mentioned Mad Magazine. There's Alfred E. Newman in my little show here, if, if you're listening, um, that uh, this is talking about that influence. So I mentioned the irony of uh, being a fan of Mad and Spy vs. Spy. Mad Magazine tapped me to um, try out for Spy vs. Spy, which I almost passed on. I would have kicked myself for the rest of my career. Um, and what I did was I thought, well, if I'm going to do this, and this is in 1995 or 1996, um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I have to bring my own thing to it. So I did it in stencils and spray paint for my, my uh, trial and thought they'll look at this, they'll hate it. It'll be over with. And it turned out what they were looking for was a different style, but that, that kept with the uh, original characters. And um, I found myself now doing it for 25 years. I just did my last one. Uh, the issue came out in April. Um, so it turned out to be uh, a, a, a more than a small move in my life. And, um, and something that I, you know, it's like a revisiting of my 10 year old self every time I did one. Um, so there's a, a picture I'm showing of uh, me in first grade with my friend, Seth Debachman. We knew each other in Cleveland, met in our very first class. Um, a lot of art that was being done that I grew up with around the Vietnam War and all there was there was some really light you know lighter upbeat things like war is not healthy for children other living things poster that was on a lot of people's walls um Seth and I did a fanzine during this time um our first one was called fanzine with a ph we were way ahead of fat um and we also did one called gaslight that was for the Cleveland Graphic Art Society which I was president of and Seth was vice president, I believe. And we did um, several issues over this, starting when we, we were 11, 12, through about 15, um, we did, did this magazine. Um, this cover is done by Gary Dumb, who later worked for Harvey Picar. Harvey Picar helped get us an interview for our, um, our first issue of Gaslight um, with Robert Crumb, because he knew him, and Harvey Picar was in Cleveland. Um, so I would have loved to do happier art, but um, due to a number of circumstances, I found that I was, you know, growing up where my father was, was rather rabid uh, news watcher and we would watch the nightly news over dinner. And the idea of like, I was seeing the Vietnam War unfold and you know, what was happening with Richard Nixon and eventually Watergate and, uh, you know, and then saying pass the potatoes. So I think this in order to digest, I probably developed my sense of humor. Um, and another very early comic that I read uh, when I was in Israel, actually, especially, was uh, all the Harvey comics, which was Casper and, and uh, Hot Stuff and a Little Lotta, Little Dot, and uh, Richie Rich. And when I got to New York, and uh, one of the early places I found work was as an inker on Richie Rich. I went and I did samples for about a month and um, got this job. And I would found I was going pretty quickly. I was going blind doing it, um, but I really had very few skills and just inking up another penciler's work. And it was simpler art was something that was very possible for me to do. And I, um, it really had a huge influence on my style. Ultimately, unfortunately, mostly I was inking their worst artists because they, they knew I was a lousy inker. And so they gave me sort of the lowest on the totem pole of pencilers. And, um, but this is extremely helpful, and it especially came in handy later when I was doing parodies, like when I did 
of uh, George Bush called Richie Bush. Um, and there's a long story that goes with this about censorship. I won't go into right now, but suffice to say that uh, the comic book legal defense fund had to help me out with uh, to get this through customs. Um, so there's a picture I did of Ronald Reagan. So Ronald Reagan was coming into office at the time and uh, um, that I was in art school and I went to Pratt Institute in Brooklyn. Seth had moved to New York as well. And we um, kind of rekindled our then failing friendship in art school. And we were both interested in, in comics. And at this point in 1978, 79, 80, um, the underground comic scene had completely collapsed and I thought I was going to become an underground comic artist. And uh, the only place I could find work that was close to that was heavy metal. But um, we had done a fanzine together and um, we therefore knew something about self-publishing and we saw a lot of really cool art on the streets and we wanted to um, publish not on our, only our own work, but also the work that we were seeing around town. So we started this magazine influenced by our fear of nuclear war, and we called it World War III Illustrated. And very quickly, other people joined us in this process. And so we started, we did, the first issue was published just before 1980, 19, late December of 79. And year after year, we found ourselves doing this. We are now uh, coming up and, and women joined us. Um, a lot of people who weren't originally cartoonists, who like looked at this and said, hey, I'd like to do you know, try out comics. And we gave a lot of people a forum for some of their first work, which led to their eventual graphic novels. And um, many of them have gone on to have successful careers as graphic novelists and do their own magazines as well. 9-11 um, was a point in particular, I realized the importance of having alternative media because um, we were all in New York at the time. I could see the smoking, uh, buildings of 9-11 from my studio all the way up at 102nd Street and Broadway. And um, we were all, you know, deeply affected. The world was affected in many ways. But uh, here in New York, we had firsthand experiences. And we were able to publish an issue um, where we had longer stories that talked about our, our feelings that didn't include necessarily, we immediately need to go to war and Iraq and uh, Afghanistan. And now there wasn't any other publications that would allow that kind of conversation. And people like Art Spiegelman ended up publishing some of their first pieces that, uh, that became say the shadows of no tower um, because they could not get that work published around the time of 9-11. It took years for things to sort of settle down. Um, and we talked about what a bad idea it would be to go to Iraq, unfortunately, uh, and Afghanistan, unfortunately, um, you know, the magazine with a you know, circulation of on a high level, you know, several thousand um, did not change the hearts and minds of uh, our government. Um, the secret to our success, I think, is um, we've never been paid. So, in fact, usually have to put money in each issue as editor. When I edit an issue and I don't do every issue, but I do a lot of them. Um, it just means I have to do a whole lot more work, have a lot more people hate me whose work I don't run. And, um, uh, but uh, that we don't have any money to fight over and more art groups, bands, and you know, musicians have collapsed over doing well. So we're not threatened by huge success or any money. Um, and that has kept us around and still working on a new issue. Um, I used to kind of compartmentalize the work and um, I should say, I also, I experimented with stencil and spray paint. Seth and I did a few graphics and Seth was doing stencil comics actually as early as, um, you know, the early eighties. And I saw one of his stencils and it just completely knocked me out. Just the quality of it. I had been doing linoleum prints and um, it, which is kind of like woodcut. And um, what he did, what happened with stencil, it just had this very active quality. And so I experimented with that. And then I tried to bring that into my comics, but I also said, you know, I, I think this would work for illustration. And there was really no one else uh, using this approach. And uh, I did a lot of dopey computer illustrations. A lot of, I have piles of illustrations that I did for, you know, within the first decade of my career that I could just throw and throw out and, and have. Um, but doing comics for, 
literally the first decade of my career was a, was a hobbyist thing. It was published in World War III, Fantagraphics, perhaps, but there really wasn't any outlets for to make a, a living. You know, heavy metal was my biggest paying client for comics. So other than that, it, it was illustration was what kept me going. And but, but I hit a point where I just simply couldn't do illustrations about widgets and nothing in particular, which I was at first happy to do just to get any work. But then I just found that that kind of work was really poison. And so I started doing more directed. I turned down work that wasn't social, political topics. And I learned how to say this to art directors without insulting them. And um, I found I could really do about 10 times as many illustrations on subjects that I cared about because I understood them. And I also, as much as I was had this style that was why they were calling me, they were also calling me for my concepts, which is ultimately was it, what I really have been trying to promote. And so it's not just a style thing, because then if I, if it's just style, then if I change my style, people don't want to hire me anymore necessarily. And styles go out of fashion like clothing. So I found that I, I shifted as I got bored with the style, my concept is what kept going and kept uh, me getting hired. Um, here was my, in my first uh, big graphic novel that I was able to get paid for. I did uh, for Classics Illustrated uh, uh, first comics, which went bankrupt as they published The Jungle uh, by Upton Sinclair. They did a whole series of Classics Illustrated. And I chose this one about uh, the meatpacking industry at the turn of the century. And I showed the art director one stencil illustration said, I want to do the whole book this way. I had not, I, I had experimented with that, but I had not done it before. But I thought it would be really a, a new way to do comics. And comics is in, so much in its infancy in terms of just by doing a different style, you, you can do something new in comics by doing different formatting and storytelling. Um, and my, my storytelling was very influenced by the comics I drew when I was traveling because I did kind of like these developing comics where I would draw one panel and then the events would continue happening and I'd add another panel. And I tried to bring that into the storytelling for something like The Jungle where I did more free flowing, not necessarily you know, square panels, have them flow together. Um, and bring in also my influences through fine arts and illustrations and uh, the German expressionists and, you know, different artists that I looked at over the years. Um, before I got the chance to do uh, the wordless book of the um, of spy, I mean, the wordless comics of Spy vs. Spy, I uh, first got asked by the New York Times if I wanted to do a comic strip for a new section. And knowing that the editors there are word people, I presented a wordless comic called Eye of the Beholder, which um, they went for, and I did for six months for the paper. It was the first uh, comic that appeared in the New York Times. And then I syndicated to alternative papers for a decade. Uh, but I got very versed in doing wordless comics. And uh, a, a friend of mine who had worked at a small magazine worked at High Times as an editor, at one point asked me, uh, became an editor at DC Vertigo and said, hey, um, got any ideas? And I put forward an idea that had been percolating that I had no idea where I could pitch it uh, called The System that was about these things that happened in New York and interconnected lives that are all connected through um, the subway. Um, and the way I work on it is I, I broke it down on an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, little tiny square boxes that I, I drew what would happen. I wrote what would happen in each box. I actually did a script for it in order to be paid as a writer for a wordless book. Um, and then I use these little booklets and I, I draw um, at, at uh, one third size of the thing and I rough, rough out my stories. And I, I do this with pretty much all of my long form graphic novels. I have a, um, I, a format I use where I do do a thumbnail, tiny, then slightly bigger, one third size. Then I go to same size as the printed book. So what I draw won't be, I won't put too many details in that are superfluous for when, the, when it's printed. Then I enlarge that um, 125% photocopy, enlarge it. And in this case, I did a stencil. And a stencil is basically on cutting holes in paper 
uh, with a with a uh, um, you know, using my pencil as an indicator. I then cut holes in in, in paper where the black is going to be, and those holes I then spray with regular old spray paint. I, I don't use an airbrush. I use spray cans, and um, very highly toxic form I use. And this is what it, what it looks like when you first spray it. I sprayed it first in red, and then without moving the stencil, sprayed black. And you get this interesting quality of a stencil is very the image is very graphic, but then when you spray it, the spray gets underneath the paper. And so you get this slightly off focus quality, which gives it a less um, just, you know, like hard edge, um, but rather it becomes uh, um, more sprayed and blurry, which I, I just, I love the X factor. Um, I spray it on watercolor paper, and then I can go in with watercolor, colored pencil, uh, other, other medium. Um, there's another example. Uh, if, you are, if you are not seeing this, uh, it's it, another spray. I included uh, some blue paint in there as well, and then watercolor it to get achieve this, this quality. Um, another uh, area that interests me is, is um, how where writing can meet um, art in, in a way where, and, and in some cases where uh, classic writing can merge. I love the idea of working with a writer, but having worked with living writers, I found it a lot easier to work with dead writers. People like um, Upton Sinclair and Franz Kafka. Um, a friend of mine kind of reintroduced me to Kafka. I had read him in school and I found his writing to be quite dark. I didn't see the humor in it so much, but uh, he, we read it, he read it short stories to me aloud over beers and I, we'd laugh heartily about it, which I understood later uh, Kafka did the same. Um, so The Metamorphosis was one, one book that I tackled and um, before I did that, actually, uh, The Simpsons asked me to uh, do a Treehouse of Horror story, and I took uh, Homer Simpson and uh, put, made him be the Gregor Sampson of my story, and he wakes up as part bug. Though, um, I also looked at cartooning that was done around the time that Kafka was writing, which was, you know, in the early 1900s. Um, I looked at people like Lionel Feininger, who's did uh, Wee Willie Winkie's World in like, 1906, and um, Windsor McKay, who did tons and tons of incredible comics that were very dreamlike, like Dreams of the Rare Bit Fiend, Little Nemo in Slumberland. Uh, he did he did all sorts of things like this, and they um, uh, they they helped me understand what you know, kind of the zeitgeist of the period of, of Kafka. There was also Franz Masseril who was doing these woodcut books and I was very interested in the German expressionist qualities. I just was drawn to that kind of the immediacy that, that you get from this, this kind of hard edge style. Um, and that was going on in uh, German expressionist film as well, like uh, Robert um, Weiner, um, 1920s film, Doctor, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari. Um, that had very you know surrealist qualities that were very Kafkaesque, um, and uh, there, Lynn Ward in the United States did a book called God's Man that was all wordless, woodcut. Uh, the whole story is wordless, and Will Eisner cited this book as an influence, and it was a huge influence on on me as well. And a lot of artists that I know, like Eric Drucker, who uh, um, and Seth, who are you know love this sort of graphic quality that that um, these artists got. Um, so I experiment around with the characters as I'm developing a, a graphic novel, get to know them like Greg or Samsa. So I'm drawing them different ways and, and uh, getting reference um, before I was going on the internet, which is, you know, makes Google makes everything available. I would find things on the internet and as reference and get tons and tons of reference and do a thumbnail of the story. Um, for Kafka, I felt that Scratchboard which is a chalk covered paper that you can, um, uh, uh, the type that I found was thin and I could, uh, it was, and white and I could apply ink to it and light box my drawings on there and then add ink and then scratch into it to achieve something that felt like a woodcut. And um, it really felt like it, it would help give the quality of, of the time period. And to me, it's really important like, to decide stylistically what is appropriate for the writing, not say, here's my style, I overlay it on everything I do. 
but rather how does the author's work speak to me or even how does the period of that I'm trying to convey uh, what will best convey that. So I chose uh, this kind of German expressionist tone for Kafka. And um, that seemed to be very fitting. And, just, and it was really a natural, I, you know, I, I wasn't trying to overlay this on it. It just seemed like the tone that you would get with Kafka. And one of the things I love about Kafka is that his work really um, is, it's so open to, to interpretation. And I really, I hope that people who see my interpretation of it will go back to the source material and read Kafka and see what they get from it. Mine is merely one interpretation. I read a story called, it's really, really short story called The Trees. And it, to me, it read as being talking about homelessness. So I did a story about homelessness using his words, but you could read that story and just be about trees. Uh, there's a, another short story called Before the Law, which I, I dawned upon me, hey, this could be about civil rights. It's somebody who's trying to get justice and um, trying to get through the doors to get to justice and they're being blocked. And my, uh, my recent book, Kafka S, collects all of these short stories. And there's also the uh, Metamorphosis is, is uh, an available book. Um, and the, these have gotten published now in uh, lots of foreign languages. And that's led to um, exhibitions that I had. I currently have an exhibition in Slovenia of my work from uh, Kafka Esk. And um, I love the idea of the cartooning and illustration and uh, like moving back and forth between fine arts world, something that's on a wall and something that's in print and something that's um, literally on a wall outside somewhere and how you can make these things translate uh, into different um, formats. And um, so I tried things that artist books uh, and uh, these, you know, silk screen and um, different examples of shows where I've, I've, I've had the opportunity to display my work and these comics. And it, you know, it's important to remember the comics, like I said, the first decade of my career and really first 20 years of my career, I wasn't, comics were considered to be something for kids in the United States, certainly. And I'd always be explaining that you could do other things with comics really. Um, and it was nice to uh, um, be able to, um, you know, now be at a point where they've jumped into the fine arts world and are, are more widely accepted. In 2006, um, my, my wife and I had a daughter and um, when she came up on a similar age to what I was when, when I, my father had a sabbatical, um, I, you know, and moved to Israel at age 10, I got beat up a lot. I had a lot of trouble with the language. Uh, I felt like an outsider, really lost. And I thought when my daughter turned 10, I want her to have the same experience. And we thought we'd choose a place where the language is a little more useful and Spanish is, is one of those. And we picked a town very randomly in Mexico called Oaxaca. And I thought in 2006, it'd be a great chance to get away from politics and away from George Bush, America. And I'd have time to draw in my sketchbook. My daughter would have time to get beat up at the local uh, all Spanish speaking high school and <laughs> elementary school, which she did. And it was, um, and she learned Spanish in four months. Um, and no matter what, the bomb is always following me around. So even when I'm in a beautiful, serene environment like uh, Mexico, I'm always thinking about the bomb. A uh, funny thing happened though, on the way to Mexico, we forgot to do our homework and there turned out to be a teacher strike there. And it was an annual event that uh, happens every, 20, every year and ha had for 25 years. But this year, there had been kind of a coup. The governor had taken office uh, and um, he, uh, instead of giving the teachers a small raise they normally get, he decided to attack them. And this turned into a giant strike that instead of lasting two weeks as it normally would, lasted seven months. And the town was overrun with federal troops. And I realized, oh, you know, I'm not trying to get away from politics. I just want a different politics. So this is what I started drawing in my sketchbook. And um, there was burning buses and, um, and people getting shot. And my wife and I decided um, we were gonna stay for one year and instead we decided to stay for two. Um, yes, slightly insane, but um, it was such an amazing town, is such an amazing town. And it was, it, it, that was, this is just such a small element of what was going on. It was so artistic and beautiful and the people were so great. Um, so I was drawing these things and then that ended up leaping into newspapers and eventually learned, turned into a, my uh, the book that I did when I got back from Mexico, I we arrived back from Mexico in 2008 just in time for the uh, the crash, 
Um, and um, uh, work, I, I, my work disappeared. My style went through a big overhaul because I stopped being interested in, in stencils and spray paint because it was incredibly toxic. And after decades of doing it, I just thought, I don't want to die for my style. Um, so the work I was able to find was I'm working for a Mexican publisher who asked me if I wanted to illustrate Alice in Wonderland. And I just used my more sketchbooky style and approach and with a little digital magic thrown in there. And um, I had a really great time doing that, although the pay was almost near zero. But um, I, I try to figure out ways to make things work and um, do the work that appeals to me and hope that it will that's what will be my best work. And, um, uh, we're, you know, regardless, you know, the, the, really the bottom line is you only have an audience of, a, of one, which is yourself. So hopefully you do something you love and then at least one person is happy. And I certainly was happy about working on this project. Um, it percolated for about five years, but I also came up with an idea that was sort of based on our time in Mexico, which included a visit to see the Monarch Butterfly Sanctuary and uh, where they, they come by the millions from Canada. And, um, and I, I came up with sort of a fictional account of a couple moving down there who don't have a kid. And uh, I called it Ruins. And uh, um, I drew up this story and I pitched it uh, to many publishers and um, no one was interested in it. I finally found a publisher. And after 20 publishers turning it down, I found one in England who did it. Um, but it all worked out in the end. Um, and, um, I was able to complete the book sort of a, felt like a suicide mission because it took me three years to complete, uh, while doing other work in order to make a living because uh, the English publisher wasn't paying me very much. Um, but I did something that was really close to my heart. So again, um, I'm, I'm showing here these sketches that were thumbnails. They're really tiny. I do them in these little booklets, one third size. This is what the booklet light looks like I'm holding up a booklet teeny little booklet I put together and then uh, I do a tighter pencil and then I enlarge that and I that's pen and ink at uh, like 25 percent larger than the print size and then I digitally colored these so this is sort of like new direction style pen and ink and digital coloring um, another project that I did just recently uh, was uh, an adaptation of Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness um, and uh, I was asked, the publisher who did my collection of Kafkaesque, which I put forward to them, said, okay, we'll do Kafkaesque if you're willing to adapt Joseph Conrad. And I, that would certainly, it was up my alley. Um, but the, the, the book Heart of Darkness is from 1899. And it's definitely got its itchy problem of being from its era and the racist aspects of it, which certainly have been rightly complained about by different um, uh, critics. And so I thought, what can I do with this book to bring it into the 21st century? So I, I thought, what if I flip the perspective? So I don't have to flip the text, uh, you know, some text I, I, uh, I, I altered in my version of it, but um, that for the most part, it was more a matter of flipping the perspective. And so when Conrad talks about Africa as this sort of blank place that we, they were shooting their cannonballs into, or the French were, I thought like, oh, well, let's show who's being shot by the cannonball. And, um, and then just, you know, continuously flip the perspective on this. Um, also stylistically, I was drawing it kind of like, you know, not scratch board as I did with Kafka, but closer to what I, how I draw in my sketchbook, which seemed appropriate because uh, Conrad drew, uh, I mean, actually did sketches, but also wrote, kept a journal for his trip to the, the Congo, which is, what this the book is inspired by, um, and I got to see the original um, actual um, his his diaries that they have at Harvard, um, and um, it was it's a thrill to be in the same room as that. So I'm showing the pages of my thumbnails and a closer up example of one, a tighter one that goes into the tiny little booklet to figure it out. This really helps me read through the story and see if it the pacing works before I get to the more complicated drawings. Then there's the, uh, the uh, tighter pencil, then enlarged and put onto uh, watercolor paper and done with uh, gray washes. 
And, uh, and then I add the type, which is based on my hand lettering after the fact, so I can edit it and move it around. It's really, I really want to be able to, to make these minor adjustments. Another thing I recommend it to, you know, people creating work, sound is very important to me as well. I started working on this book um, and it smells a lot of the work that I do in my sketchbook, I'm doing in, in the place where I am. And that is affected by the sun, the smell, you know, the smell of cooking food on the street, um, a dead animal and, um, and the, uh, uh, you know, the, maybe the, the chirp of birds. So sometimes like when I was working on Heart of Darkness, I went to go I Googled sounds of the jungle while working on scene of the jungle. And it's extremely helpful in getting more than just the visuals in there. There's another layer that you can't even calculate. And um, so, and here's a show that is currently at Harvard's uh, Houghton Library that has uh, the diaries by uh, Joseph Conrad and my original drawings, which very happily they acquired. And that's helped me uh, do some of my free projects. So um, I put my daughter through college. Um, so I, I love playing around with comics and how they can, uh, you know, experiments that one can do in storytelling. And um, uh, I found myself weirdly transforming into a gag cartoonist that seemed appropriate when um, what I thought was a humorous figure, which was Donald Trump, um, was making his way towards the presidency. I made fun of that in 2000 when he was running for as a, a candidate and unsuccessfully. I, in fact, uh, did a story called The Wall for um, Heavy Metal Magazine 1990, where I imagined hilariously what would happen if Donald Trump uh, becomes president and builds a wall separating the rich from the poor from the east side from the west side of Manhattan. And um, just a hilarious story of what this crazy notion of him becoming president. And uh, um, now I have to figure out a way to do a comic about him um, disappearing forever. Don't stare at um, the uh, eclipse of Donald Trump where you may experience blind rage. Um, and I'm as perpetually worrying about the bomb, especially with guys like him in office when he was around. Um, this is a comic I did that I'm showing this uh, uh, based on a Windsor McKay, uh, Little Sammy Sneeze. I love also referencing comics and using that as a uh, way to uh, do, um, you know, like um, influence and, um, and associate with older comics for doing more current events. So I did this Little Donald Sneeze um, and actually wildly the, this art ended up in the Library of Congress. Um, and was uh, turned into a poster. Uh, I ran in the New Yorker, um, the Library of Congress acquired it, and then I made it into a poster that um, was a, as a fundraiser for a group called Feeding America and happily raised about $1,300 for them. Um, there's an old Jack Kirby monster comic cover that in, helped influence this piece I did of Donald Trump. I love cribbing my old favorites like that. and. Uh, uh, George Surratt, a uh, little, little digital mag magic to take uh, um, Sunday in the park with George into uh, um, a, uh, a memory of COVID alone in the park. And this is a image of a Dr. Seuss book, The Sneetches, which I turned into The Spreaders and Other Facts by Dr. Fauci. Um, so I found myself kind of morphing into a gag cartoonist and doing work for The New Yorker and a lot of other publications and um, it just, it kind of naturally flowed. And because I'm doing it, my work is a lot based on concepts Then I'm not, I, then if I move in a direction like that, style is less the issue than uh, what, what I'm saying. And so now I'm talking about as much as possible climate change. And I've done this over the years in different formats and, uh, in different styles and more recently uh, this is from my sketchbook i'm showing uh, of guatemala where i i drew where i got to experience rainforest um, being uh, uh de deforested and what that means over the years um and uh i try to do these things with some humor because nobody likes them i told you so 
and I try to think positively. Unfortunately, some of the time I'm feeling positive that we're doomed, but, um, and here's a way these kind of things again can jump off the page. This is a image from a postcard for a show that's opening on uh, the 13th in a couple of days in, at uh, Ohio State on called Power Lines on Comics and the Environment. Um, I try also to, you know, not just show the way things are in their worst sense, although I am drawn towards that, but to also show the way things might be and maybe try and do something a little more positive um, and, uh, you know, show the, the beauty of the music that I listen to and the, all the things that influenced me that made me also want to become a cartoonist and create rather than destroy. And uh, as a, some, a stencil piece I saw in, in Mexico said, the revolution will, will not be televised, but I do believe it will be illustrated. So I will now stop sharing. And if you have any questions, then I'd be happy to answer them. Well, people, people listening to the podcast, uh, I, I really encourage you to try to check out the clips on YouTube uh, when I clip this, or um, if you can uh, uh, subscribe to the Patreon, I may, I may uh, take this out from behind the paywall just so people can experience what I experienced, which was watching my own podcast video before I had actually done it. <laughs> But that was fantastic. I like show and tell. I like <laughs> show and tell. Since I teach, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, it's a visual medium, and and uh, you know, talking about is certainly can work. But um, having uh, visuals to accompany that is is essential to me. I, I fall back on that. That was fantastic. I appreciate that. Um, I I do uh, I do want to circle back to your formative years before. Um, uh, before we, we move on. Um, so these zines that you were doing with Seth, fanzine and, sorry, what was the other one? Gaslight. It's the Graphic Art Society Light of uh, Cleveland. Cleveland Graphic Art Society. That was, it was the title of, a, of the, there was a little uh, Mimeo graph. It's an old style form of printing um, that, that like the, Guy who was the head of it. it was a small group of us that got together at a YMCA in downtown Cleveland, put some comics on the table, and then talked about comics for two hours or three hours. And um, it was, uh, you know, the comic fandom was so tiny that if you went to a comic convention, it was like it could be a few hundred people or at most a few thousand. The New York Comic Convention was that. It was all guys for the first uh, many years that I went to conventions, maybe for the first. I don't know, seven years. And, um, you know, what, what we see now with Comic-Con and, and these conventions around the world is it just, it, it's so transformed. And there's a quality that, you know, I have to say I miss on one end because it's, um, there was the intimacy that you got, where, you know, where artists were right there and nobody was like special, like, oh, you have to wait in line for 12 hours to uh, get, a, get a signature or ask them a question. Uh, everybody was extremely accessible, um, but uh, and also I could read pretty much every underground comic that came out and most of the comics that came out. Um, and now that would be an impossibility. But I mean, that is in the United States, not not internationally. But, um, you know, of course, it's way better now because it's the topics are broader. The you know, it, it, there's so many more interesting things going on. That, and so I welcome that in the same way. It's like when I went traveling, if, if I went to Bali. There was always somebody standing around to say, oh, you should have seen the place 10 years ago. And I always resented that. And so I was like, you know, I, this is my time. So shut up. But then, of course, you know, when I went back 10 years later, it was very hard not to say you should have seen this place 10 years ago. But um, that's just a conundrum of, of uh, you know, time moving on and seeing something that you experience and feeling like, you know, it, it was better at one point. But living in New York, I have to say, you know, it's like constantly evolving. And it was, like I said, it, dangerous and scary and, 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 you know, infinitely dirtier before. And in many ways, better in terms of being an artist moving to New York and not needing a ton of money. Now it's much harder to do that. And that's 
deeply unfortunate, but um, I, I'll take New York as it is now too. Now, at the time that you were doing these zines and heading to uh, uh, the period when you, you went to Pratt, did you, did you already know that comics was something you wanted to do for a living? And did you go to art school specifically with that in mind? Um, at the time, no, I had just like zero ability. I was not one of these, uh, you know, people who I love and resent that I, you know, like were drawing at age four, incredible, you know, wow, look at that fantastic work. Um, I, I was barely scribbling when I was about 15, I got a sketchbook and I started copying, um, the comics I was reading, creepy, eerie underground comics, uh, and, you know, trying to draw an occasional superhero or Conan, uh, just terrible. Um, and I just, nothing would have indicated that, that I would have the ability to move any further forward. Uh, when I got towards the end of high school, I kind, kind of freaked out with this thought of like, I don't have, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, I'm sort of like in the event of war, I'm a hostage. I don't, in, I, I don't have like a job direction that, that I feel comfortable with. The only thing I love is comics. And uh, I started doing more art. Uh, maybe when I'm 17, I started getting more serious about it. And I started experimenting with things like linoleum prints. And suddenly there was something, it was like osmosis from all the comics I read that I got a little better. And I went to art school. I went to uh, school at Kent State for a year. Um, my father being a teacher, I could go to Kent State for free. My grades didn't get me into any other of the schools I tried, art schools I tried to go to. Um, but the year at Kent State, which is really kind of like, it's a state school and it, it, it was mostly like a jock school. And I, did, I really felt like a fish out of water and thought like, if I don't, I have to get to art because uh, I'm not going to do well with um, football. And um, uh, I went to New York on spring break and I went around with my sketchbook, which was a little better, but not much. And um, went to animation houses and said, I will do anything for you. I like in paint blue backgrounds. And an animation firm amazingly said, okay, fine, we'll work on this film. We need all the hands we can get. Raggedy Ann and Andy. I moved to New York for that job. And um, the guy did not remember me when I went to his office and was like, oh, what, who, what, you know, uh, call me in six weeks. And I, I was like, well, what do I do in the meantime? He's like, I, I don't know. And I had, you know, a room I was renting for a hundred dollars a month. I could afford that. Um, I was getting a little help from my parents. And um, I literally, you know, I sat on the street at one point and did drunk caricatures of people as the animals I saw them as. Uh, I, I walked around to, to magazines and tried to do some illustration. And that's where I stumbled upon the Richie Rich job. And um, I bumped into another cartoonist that I had met at a comic convention named Howard Chicken. And uh, Howard, I, I met at my first New York convention in 1971. And here we were in 1978, I bumped into him and he was looking for an assistant. And he, because uh, he just vaguely knew me from comic conventions, he was like, like what are you doing here? I was like, I'm trying to be an artist. And he, uh, um, so I, um, I said, well, you know, gave me a tryout. And mostly, you know, I was filing things for him. And then he started having me do a little bit of basic color. And uh, it was in a studio of other cartoonists. And um, among them was a guy named Walt Simonson, uh, James Sherman, um, Val Merrick, um, Jim Starlin was in there. And then um, Jim Starlin was replaced by uh, Frank Miller, who came in when he was working on Daredevil. And my interest in mainstream comics had, had waned, even though I was working for a, a cartoonist while I was doing Richie Rich and in school, I was in a work studies program at, at Pratt. Um, um, my interest in, in mainstream comics was waning um, as my interest in fine art and just general art and underground comics was fairly strong. Um, but Frank Miller's Daredevil was quite interesting to me and, and actually the work of other artists in that was interesting. I also got, I got to be in an environment uh, working there, which is really seven days a week where I saw how people worked and I saw what it was involved in making a living. And uh, uh, Howard Chaikin was doing advertising art and things like that. And I got pretty adept 
at working with magic markers for him. My, my skills set started coming up as he browbeat me into getting things right. And um, that it was a very trial by fire working for him. And uh, he would do like an advertising job that was an overnight and I rush in, you know, be there uh, on the weekends. And I looked at this and, you know, I started getting asked if I wanted to do advertising art and I, I knew what I didn't want to do at least. And um, it helped me to find things. And I also just looked at a whole range of art uh, while doing his file system. I looked at a lot of illustrators um, and I looked at a lot of gag cartoonists and things that I had already been interested in, but it really expanded that. Now, your time at Pratt, were you in the illustration program? Uh, I was in the fine arts. I was painting, drawing, but I took a ton of uh, illustration courses. And sometimes, again, I said I was in work studies and I for uh, I ended up going to college ultimately for five years and I uh, never graduated. Um, and um, comics was mostly discouraged by, by most of the teachers. They would say like, oh, okay, I guess, you know, do that, but but also, you know, stick with the illustration or fine art, um, but, which was really good ultimately because one of the problems with comics is that a lot of cartoonists, um, and it's particularly true in, main, in mainstream superhero things, it's like a zombie art form because they're always eating on the same, you know, they're looking at, at artists who do comics to do comics. And so you end up with these styles that are like so inbred that they, they just, you know, get less and less interesting. And that by looking at work outside of comics a lot, being pressed to do that, I think helped me to bring more to the form than just, um, you know, regurgitating somebody else's comics. Although I, Lord knows I do that too. And I'm very interested in looking at early comic strips and looking at other artists work. Um, but um, that I, I also find that, I, that there's a lot more <laughs> To look at and even just you know looking at nature looking at the, the real world um to draw on for stories and things like that not necessarily fantasy and science fiction and whatnot but um uh i hope that answered your question yeah that's that's the funny thing about pratt like their their illustration program they really push um they push their students into, you know, editorial, even children's book illustration and kind of discourage them from going to comics. Well, at the same time, when they promote their famous alumni, it's always guys like Kent Williams, George Pratt, John Van Fleet, you know, people who worked in comics. Um, well, you know, all those guys, that's when I went to school. I mean, I, I did work for, Kent Williams did a, uh, a fanzine called Dark Storm that I published my work in that. Uh, Dan Klaus was going to school at the same time. Um, and so, you know, it was, it, there were these people that ended up moving into the field and all of us were kind of doing that on our own to one side. And that, that um, you know, you'll notice though, somebody like, like Kent or, or, Kent or um, uh, John Van Fleet uh, or, or George Pratt are very fine on, you know, fine art influence and ended up moving more and more into a fine art world style, you know, approach or, and being in galleries. So that, that it was in, in this interesting cross, uh, you know, crossover between things um, that, that where I think a lot of, you know, people were interested in comics that then moved back into fine arts. Um, so anyway, they, I think all of them were served very well by, by having the fine arts influences, but, you know, it really was, we, we were being discouraged from comics, but now of course, their comics are taught at Pratt at, you know, I mean, if you don't talk about sequential art, you're missing the, with the current event of what can be done. But for me, actually what happened was I had a friend at, at Pratt named Mark, Mike Bartalos who was already starting to go out and get work at the New York times. And they didn't even teach us about doing a portfolio. And I, he showed me what he was showing. And I was like, Hey, wow, I could do that. I put together a portfolio. And in my, my final year at Pratt, I went to the New York times and I started getting work there. And suddenly, you know what, I would get paid, you know, uh, to do almost like a whole book for Fantagraphics was the same price as I got paid for one illustration for the New York Times. So it was, it was a really nutty balance, but they all, you know, it all, it all balanced out. But it was, I, I found I had a real 
interest in illustration actually that lasted for ages. I still, you know, sort of jump in a little bit now and again, but um, I really, I, I, I got as much from my the fellow students as I got from, from what was going on in school itself. And, you know, one of the great things about being in art school is who you kind of cross paths with and that, you know, that, that kind of cross breeding, but also um, having time to experiment and not have to know, and not necessarily, you know, ideally not have to be making a living at the same time. I was, you know, I did end up, you know, working and ultimately like taking out loans that I took me, you know, a, a decade to pay off, but it, they weren't huge like some people are experiencing these days. And I definitely got my money's worth out of going to art school. But um, it's just curious how it's all shifted because, you know, I, I then ended up teaching at School of Visual Arts. And then, you know, relatively more recently, I got hired to teach at Harvard. And, you know, I, and it was their first comics class, actually, you know, teaching how to, how to do comics. And um, I still am teaching there. So uh, this leads me into uh, something I noticed in your presentation where a lot of the um, a lot of the exhibitions uh, uh, that display your work are in Europe. Um, would you say that the perception of comics and what comics are and what they can what they can accomplish is much different in Europe than it is in the United States? Um, less so these days, but um, it was very true for uh, decades and decades. I mean, I gone to the, the big French festival uh, in Angoulême um, that, uh, you know, they were uh, showing and appreciating and have museums of comics decades before that occurred in the United States. I mean, Japan has a huge manga, um, you know, their, their culture of comics is, is gigantic. Uh, and that was also decades before the United States got on board with that. Um, it's really only since 2000 that mainstream publishers is, have started to be interested in graphic novels. And now the biggest selling books in some of those areas are graphic novels. And, you know, I mean, in publishing are graphic novels. So there's been a really, a, a, a paradigm shift in that interest in all. Actually, when I showed you the, the, the uh, exhibitions, all but one of them were in the United States. Um, and that, that uh, you know, I currently have one uh, at a museum in Arkansas, um, Bradbury Museum and one coming up shortly at, uh, at the uh, Billy Ireland at Ohio State and um, the, the, um, uh, the one at, at Harvard. Um, the, the one I showed you was in Slovenia, but um, they, there is a lot of interest and a lot of possibilities for Europe, of course, um, and, uh, and, and that appreciation, the fine, kind of a fine arts appreciation, but um, uh, that, that hasn't 100% caught up here in terms of, say, museums collecting um, art by cartoonists. Um, I think, you know, Robert Crumb is one of the few that sort of crossed over, uh, Spiegelman has crossed over um, to the fine arts world more, but um, there's relatively few of that. But I think in Europe, it, there's a greater appreciation and that, you know, the heroes of, of the French uh, art world include many cartoonists. Now, uh, with the exception of, of Richie Rich, which you did very early in your career, um, your and you know you've uh, the system was published through Vertigo, which is owned by DC, and Mad Magazine is owned by the same people. Uh, for the most part, your work has uh, largely bypassed the mainstream comics apparatus. Was that intentional? Um, no, not at all. It was simply that they, they wouldn't have been interested in what I was doing. I mean, for years, I, I was offered a job as an assistant editor at Marvel that I happily passed on. Um, that was like right when I was finishing up working for Howard Chaikin because um, I was kind of in that world. I did a few things, a few oddball things for Marvel, mostly like coloring because I was doing coloring for, for Howard Chaikin. Um, so I had backdoor entry. I did a couple of inking samples for Marvel that never went anywhere. And I was all, I just realized like, this is just not, it's not for me. It's not what I'm, I'm, I'm kind of too oddball. My interests are, are away from that. I, I did some work for crazy, which was uh, Marvel's terrible mad 
uh, um, spin off, rip off. Um, and, and, you know, so I had these odd jobs, but there was really, you know, very little of that. And I was certainly not going to become a superhero artist. I mean, I didn't have the chops for it or interest, uh, but um, it, it re- so it wasn't really until uh, 2000. I mean, I had an occasional thing like, like the system or doing, doing the jungle for first comics, which, you know, a defunct published sort of in between mainstream and, and non publisher. Um, and uh, so I, I had a, a toe in the water of that, but when mainstream uh, publishers started getting into graphic novels like Random House. I was at the door, so I did Metamorphosis back in 2002, I think, for uh, for Crown, and it's you know it, it it's still sells quite a few copies every year and is in textbooks and got out in a very mainstream way. And then you know more recently, I'm now connected with W. W. Norton, who did Kafka Esque and Heart of Darkness, and um, I just signed a contract for my next book, which is a project coming out as a result of my fellowship at the New York Public Library. And it's called Intersects, uh, where it has the word insects in between uh, with the idea of the intersection between uh, arthropods, insects that is, and homo sapiens. And it's gonna be uh, several hundred pages that I'm now, I've I've got about 70 pages done from my fellowship and I'm gonna do another maybe as many as 200 more pages between now and the next two years where uh, when, my, when it's due. So I'm probably three years away from publication, but my exhibition for the library that I showed you a taste of is opening in um, probably late December in, in, a, in about a month uh, at the New York Public Library and will run there, that's at 42nd Street, until uh, August 22nd. So anybody who's listening that's in New York City can We'll be able to go to the third floor and see um, this exhibition. Now, uh, since I don't know, uh, almost the uh, uh, the inception of the comic book, the process of of drawing a comic, inking a comic, coloring a comic has um, mostly gone unchanged, except for now, mostly they're colored uh, via computer. But your your process, which is much more akin to fine arts, uh, painting and scratch board, um, uh, falls outside of that. Does that lead to any challenges in terms of printing and having your work uh, uh, mass mass produced, mass reproduced? Um, not at all. Um, it's the the thing about that actually. It's it, it's the opposite, which is instead of being a challenge, um, it gives me the opportunity to have original art that I can sell. And that I, um, a, a pretty decent aspect of my career is comes through selling original art. If I worked solely digitally, I wouldn't have that. Now, there's a digital aspect to everything I do at this point because um, one of the things that's occurred is that uh, publishers expect you to deliver a complete book in design file, ready to go to the printer. So I'm doing the design and every aspect of it and I'm scanning all my work and um, that a lot, there's one point or another where everything has sort of a digital aspect, even if it's a black and white drawing, I'm gonna scan it um, to to send it somewhere. This has opened up the possibility that I can send my work around the world easily. I can talk to people about, you know, I can send a PDF to somebody when I'm I'm pitching a book. Um, All of that used to require going door to door and showing you know, I don't know, giving out photocopies or mailing them to somebody and waiting six months to hear back. Now it's, 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 you know, a click away. So that a lot of things have been simplified. What I think a lot of people though are losing is going fully digital is they don't have original art. And so um, the Harvard, for example, acquired all of the original art from Metamorphosis and all of the original art from Heart of Darkness and um, things like that I could never do. I mean, what, what I would be selling to the Library of Congress would be a facsimile otherwise. Um, so that, that it's, it's only been a huge boon to work on paper. And also, I just physically, I'm, I'm you know, old school that way. I like to physically move that way and not, not just on a white comb tablet. Um, I find it that very irritating. But I love the fact that I can go in on an original that I've kind of flubbed some line and, and clean it up 
And, um, but yeah, you know, there's, there's things that happen that are better as accidents that, that you don't have to get the control of, or I certainly haven't been able to master making the accidents in, in, uh, in Photoshop that will give you qualities that would be similar to what you get spray painting and accidentally have a drop fall off it under the page, um, you know, things like that. By the way, now that I'm on a slightly bigger screen, this is again my little booklet um, that, you know, I draw up the story for, this is from Ruins, and I'm, I'm showing, you know, like, this is how I, oh, and here's a, here's a spread from Ruins that never made it into the book because I looked at it and said, huh, that's not working. And uh, so, um, although now that I look at it, I probably should have included it. It was better than what I did. Um, but uh, uh, so it has not been, there's been no hurdle by working on paper. I'm curious, uh, the process you described for the system, uh, meaning the stencils, the spray, the spray paint, and then going over it in, I believe you said watercolor and color pencil. Yes. Uh, per page, how long did that take? Oh, good question. You know, I mean, you have to go back to the inception of it. Um, so I'm, I have to figure out what's on the page, what's going to happen on each page, then rough it out. Um, and then, uh, then, you know, figure out the thumbnail, blow that up and all. I, I don't know, maybe, you know, if I was working really fast, maybe three days or something like that. Um, I, I had assistants. I have had assistants for many, many years. So stencil cutting, which I did a million of, is, is an aspect that I can give over to somebody and I arrive at the same exact product that I would do um, once somebody masters the art of stencil cutting. So I would be, you know, I'd, I'd be doing stencil that I would give that to somebody to cut the stencil um, so that I, you know, that there was aspects of that that I could hand off and so that that sped up what I was doing. I fortunately work pretty quickly and I'm able to work uh, to deadline. So as deadlines move closer, I would speed up my process. Um, when I was sh early showering, excuse me, showing some Time Magazine covers, some of those I had to do the same or same day job. So I'd get a call at noon. I had to do a sketch by say two or three and then turn around the finish by seven o'clock at night. And so I got pretty adept at, at moving very fast from working for newspapers and magazines with these crazy deadline turnarounds. And so um, that's been, you know, calculating how long it takes to do something is really helpful. Um, even doing a contract for a book and saying, I will have this done in two years is scary and um, often hard to figure out, but I have managed somehow to calculate, you know, this amount of pages per day at a certain point on a given book and then speed that up where I have to. And a lot of times in, in projects, I just have to come in, um, you know, for 18 hour days. And, uh, you know, this is a joy of loving what you do is working seven days a week and working on weekend, working um, weekends and nights ends up being like not a problem, just, just like more fun. It doesn't help with, you know, being around as often as you might want to with friends and family, but, um, but I have very uh, understanding. Family, I hope. Now, uh, same question, except for the the scratch board work that you did for Metamorphosis. How long did those pages take? Um, I did that book pretty quickly. I think I did the whole book in six months, and it was eighty pages. Um, uh, the you know the hardest part in those projects is to figure out to break it down and figure out what, what that's going to be. I did seven pages just as a uh, a sample um, to, to pitch it around. Um, and um, uh, I think I did those pretty quickly. One of the things that's been amazing about Kafka is I find his writing so inspiring that it just kind of falls out. So six months was pretty fast, but I did find it took me probably another six months to recover from having done it in six months. Um, so I worked very quickly, but then felt really deeply burned out. And the, and the hardest part was I was wrapping up the book on, on these beautiful summer days and I wanted to be outside instead of trapped in a room with the bug. And that got to be difficult. It's really good if you can work on a project like in the dead of winter um, when you're, when it's a certain kind of 
project like that. Um, I moved to Mexico when I was working on Heart of Darkness uh, for uh, three or four months. My wife and I went went there, and it was a perfect environment for for um, you know, we sublet our apartment, went down there, and it was fairly cheap living. And I could work on that project and get imbue it with what you know it would have been like being in the Congo because the sounds and smells and and the sun and all those things I was describing before were extremely helpful. And um, that that project took me a year. Um, and uh, now, when you're working eighteen hour days and not getting very much sunlight, uh, do you feel like you're transforming into a giant insect? Yes, I do. Uh, just a few more questions about, um, these, these adaptations that you did, uh, when you're working from source texts, like, uh, up in Sinclair, Kafka, uh, um, Heart of Darkness, how, um, how faithful, how faithfully do you want to adapt the text? How much leeway do you give yourself in terms of adapting the text? Um, well, you know, it depends on, on the length of the, the, the book, short story, you know, whatever the material is. It was, you know, so much easier with, with uh, a lot of the Kafka because they're, they're all short. So uh, getting translations, getting proper translations, and I was checking against other people's translations um, was, was the, the trick on that because um, I didn't like many of the modern translations of the Kafka and um, but I saw how much latitude, once I knew what the German was saying, I, found, I saw how much latitude various translators had taken, and that gave me a little more freedom to say, not this word, not you know that. The title of, of the story could be, say, uh, trip to the mountains rather than excursion into the mountains uh, or voyage into the mountains. And those were all the different translations that people did. I thought trip was a better word. Um, so... That, that some of them was deciding, you know, making, making that decision. With The Jungle, it was really difficult because that was a 358 page book, which uh, based on the, the, the template had to be brought down to uh, 48 pages, which is what first the, the uh, um, classic illustrator, all of them were that length. Um, so that was chopping and hacking at the story to make it not comedy because somebody was dying on other, every page otherwise, because the story is just horrific. And so cutting characters out and all that. So, um, and in fact, I lopped off the tail end of the book that goes into a diatribe about why socialism is, is important, but it's very tutorial like, and it was, it's kind of, it, it was a place that, that you could remove. And again, kind of push people to go back to the original material if they wanted to get a sense of the whole book and up in Sinclair's intent. But I, I think I got the flavor of that book um, through style and, and, you know, certain qualities. Um, but the, you know, that, that's, that, that's, if it's a longer work, that's a, that's a harder call. Um, Heart of Darkness was, was, was only like 72 pages. So that was also, you know, fairly easy to do. Um, uh, Metamorphosis is 72 pages. And so, I, and my version is 80 pages. So I could really incorporate a tremendous amount of the text, but there, there's no reason to show something and then have the text describe it, which is you know what the text is doing in order to paint a picture. I painted the picture so that I, I knew what I could drop and what I, what I needed to keep of the dialogue. So you gave a pretty comprehensive list of exhibitions you have coming up, uh, work that you published recently, as well as work that you're currently working on or currently have in progress. Uh, is there anything else you want people to know about? Anything else you're working on that you want people to you know, to keep an eye on? I mean, for? Um, in general, if if are you you know if you go to my website, which is my name, it's Peter last name is K U P E R dot com, then um, you can you can find uh, kind of like everything is that's going on. I I do uh, for some crazy reason post on uh, Twitter and Instagram, and all those things are linked on my website, and I try to at least occasionally update my site with the, with things that are going on and um, so that, you know, you can find the, uh, you know, latest print or um, spy versus spy original art or some of my latest cartoons. There's tons and tons of work on there that, uh, um, you know, so one could keep up with what it is. I, I haven't 
been updating it much lately because basically I'd rather just create new work than talk about uh, it. But uh, um, that's that's one of the those moving parts that um, one has to do. But uh, um, I also uh, co-art direct a, a website called Op Art O P P A R T that is through the Nations uh, Magazine's website and. Um, along with uh, Steve Broadner and uh, Andrea Arroyo, we art direct, uh, kind of like a World War III for illustration and fine art, uh, a political commentary daily from different artists. And um, it's, uh, it's posted five days a week. And we were sort of pushed to do this by the last president we felt urgency to comment on the day of um, what was going on. And I do that through, through Twitter and Instagram. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm posting. If anybody wants to friend me on Facebook, I, you're out of luck because I, I'm, that's the one thing I don't do. But um, uh, I, you know, it, you know, with the beauty of Google and all these things, you can see a ton of what's being done as it's happening. Um, and I know for the, the exhibition at the library, there's going to be all sorts of things associated with it. There's a whole audio aspect that I'm working on now where you'll be able to hear famous entomologists talk about uh, the images that I have on the walls and you know which insects I'm, I've drawn. And uh, there's gonna be a little animation that's gonna be part of the promo. And uh, uh, so that even if you can't make it to New York, if you go to the New York Public Library's website, after the show is up, there'll be a tour you can get through their website of my show. So you mentioned the prints and original art that you have for sale on your website. Do you want to say anything else about that or uh, how people can, um, you know, can order? If you go there, yeah, if you go there, you'll, you'll, you'll see it in all my uh, reasonable slash staggering prices. And uh, um, my email address is associated with my website. So when you go to reach out, um, um, which you will do when you try to put things in a cart and, and buy them, because um, I haven't gotten that one worked out yet. So you'll have to reach out to me directly. Um, but, uh, you know, there's, there most, most of the contact and all the things you might want to see if you're curious about spy versus spy and sketches and all that is, is all available on my website. And in addition to your Twitter and your website, I believe you also have an Instagram, right? Correct. Yes. I think it's Cooper art. It's at Cooper art again, K U P E R and, uh, funny spelling. Helps keep me more private. Is there anything else you want to say? Uh, no, thank you. And thanks for giving me the opportunity to uh, share my work. Mm -hmm.